بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله we're back after a two week break and I hope that anybody who's joining us is in good iman and health back with the book Zad al Mustaqna of Imam al Hajjawi we've reached now Kitab al Janaiz the chapter or the book pertaining to the rituals and the fiqh of the funeral prayer. Janaiz is the plural of janaza. This word janaza can be said with a fatha or it can be said with a kasra. If we say it with a fatha, it's pertaining to the dead body, the person that has died. If we say it with a kasra on the jim, janaza is pertaining to the nash, the coffin or the thing which the body is carried upon. So fatha is for the body and kasra is for the thing which the body is carried upon. Quick question to those of you. Why was it discussed at the end of the chapters pertaining to salah? Why is the ahkam of janaza, the rulings pertaining to janaza, discussed at the end of the books of salah? Ahsan barakallahu feek. That is one of the main reasons. So the ulama, they say that there's two main reasons that this comes at the end of all of the other salawat which have been discussed. The first of the reasons is that this salah differs from the other salawat uh, suratan wa ahkaman pertaining to the rulings and in the outward form. So this salah, the janazah salah, is completely different to all the others in its ruling and in the outward forms. And also, as you rightly mentioned and alluded to, is that this is the last salah that will ever be done for the person in the sense that the reward and the benefit going to the person's book of good deeds and benefiting them at the end of their life because this is at the end of the life of the believer therefore it's munasib, it's appropriate that it's put at the end of the book of salawat the author he says, may Allah have mercy upon him tusannu ayyadatul marid it's sunnah to visit the sick so he's put this now at the beginning of the chapter the book pertaining to the rulings and regulations of the janazah, of the funeral prayer. So the question is, why did the author start with this, saying that it's sunnah to visit the sick? Why is he talking about issues pertaining to visiting the sick, when this is a book of janazah, this is a book of funeral rites? Question to yourselves, why is he talking about visiting the sick? Ahsan barakallahu feek, this is correct. So uh, the sickness obviously comes in general before the death of a person, right? So this is why the author, he mentioned it at this particular juncture. Uh, what's interesting to note is that he said Iyadutul Marid and he didn't say Ziyaratul Marid. So that there's a difference between Iyada and Ziyara. Ziyara is that you visit the sick or you visit a person. Iyada gives you the meaning or gives the, holds the meaning of Tikrar of something that is done time after time. And that is the reality of visiting the sick person depending upon his situation, depending upon his state, that the person is not to be visited only once, rather is to be visited more than once as long as the sickness remains with that person, the person is to be visited. Uh, Sheikh Abdul uh, Salam al-Shawair in his explanation of Zad al-Mustaqni, he said it refers to any type of sickness. It's not just a sickness which is severe, or a sickness which is thought to be leading up to death. Rather, any type of sickness that a person has, it's recommended to visit that person in the situation of their sickness and the rewards will be gotten for a person visiting, insha'Allah. So we know that Iyadatul Marid has a huge amount of virtues in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said in one hadith, for example, in Sahih Muslim, إِنَّ Muslim, إِذَا عَادَ أَخَاهُ الْمُسْلِمْ لم يزل في خرفة الجنة حتى يرجع. That if a Muslim, or certainly a Muslim, when he visits his sick Muslim brother, then he is in the situation of plucking fruits from the trees of Jannah until he returns. So the person who visits the sick is in that beautiful situation, having huge rewards descending upon him. That he's in Jannah, as though he's in Jannah picking the fruits for the duration of the time that he is there visiting the sick. And this is just one hadith and there's many more pertaining to the virtues and uh, the recommendations to visit a sick person. Um, so the author, Al-Hajjawi Rahimullah Ta'ala, and the official opinion of the Madhab is that it's sunnah to visit the sick. 
a second قول in the madhab, a second statement or opinion in the madhab is that أن عيادة المريض واجبة على الكفاية that to visit the marid, to visit the sick person is واجب الكفاية, فرض الكفاية it's an obligation upon the community that if nobody from the community does it then the whole of the community is held sinful and accountable for this action but if somebody does do it from the community then this action is lifted off from the necks of everybody else in the community. So Ibn Taymiyyah, the, from the Hanbali scholars, was one of those Imams that held that it's Fadl Kifaya and not Sunnah. Um, pertaining to this also, if a person wants to visit a Kafir, generally this is not recommended, but if there is a Maslaha to visit a non-Muslim in his sickness, the Maslaha, a benefit, that is uh, hoped to be brought from this visit, such as giving dawah to this person or showing them how good Islam is in taking care of your neighbors, etc., then it's recommended to do that also. The author, he says, It's mustahab, it's recommended that when you visit the sick person, you remind them of the importance of making tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the importance of having the will. The importance of Tawbah is important throughout the Muslim's life as, as we know. But when it comes to a time when a Muslim is in sickness, when it comes to a time when a Muslim could be nearing his end, then it's even more important for the believer to be reminded of the importance of having sincere Tawbah with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and repenting from his many mistakes before it's too late. And it's amazing to know that many of the ulama or some of the ulama they said that istighfar not only does it bring you rizq and bring you other bounties, but it also increases you in health. So it's munasib, it's appropriate when, when a person is sick that they are reminded that they should increase in istighfar and tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So tawbah in the situation of being healthy and also more so in the situation when one is sick. And also the author, he said, wal that the person is reminded that he should think about and ensure that he has his will his will in order uh, whether the sickness is a severe sickness or not because the Muslim is supposed to have his will in order throughout his life not just in the times of sickness the author he says وَإِذَا نُزِلَ بِهِ سُنَّةَ تَعَهُدُ بَلِّ حَلْقِهِ بِمَاءٍ أَوْ شَرَابٍ وَتُنَدَّ شَفَتَيْهِ بِقَطْنَةٍ if death falls upon the person in the sense that the person one who's been visited is in the pangs of death or very close to death and it's known that this person is soon to pass then it's sunnah that the one who is taking care of him should moisten the person's lips or and pour for the person a, a tiny amount of water and to keep the lips moistened the reason uh, for doing this is because it eases the pangs of death it brings some type of ease to the one who is facing the tremendous difficulties of death and also there's this is a very important benefit from it is that it makes it easy for the person to say the shahada uh, la ilaha illallah uh, which is extremely important when the person is in that difficult and tremendous situation that by giving them a bit of water and ensuring that their lips are moist this would help them to relax slightly and this would also uh, help them to say the shahada at the time of their death the author he says وَتَلْقِينُهُ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Talqeen is that you remind the person at the time of death to say لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا اللَّهِ um, In Ahmad and Abu Dawood we have the hadith of Jabir Mu'ad ibn Jabir رضي الله عنه where the Prophet وسلم, said مَنْ كَانَ آخِرُ كَلَامِهِ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا اللَّهِ دَخْلَ الْجَنَّةِ Whoever's last words from the dunya are لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا اللَّهِ then this person will enter into Jannah. So we ask Allah to give us this favor and this blessing at the time of our death. Ameen. And also in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet said, Make talqeen for your dead people, wherein they say, La ilaha illallah. And as we just quickly mentioned, that talqeen is that you remind the dead person. You don't force him to say it, because if you force him to say it, maybe the person will become slightly upset. And so here's a question to yourselves. Uh, should this La ilaha illallah be said continuously? Should La ilaha illallah, the talqeen, be made continuously? Barakallah fiqh, exactly, this is the case. So Imam Nawi in his explanation, Rahimullah Ta'ala, of Sahih al-Muslim, he said, وَكَرِهُ الْإِكْثَارَ عَلَيْهِ وَالْمُوَالَاتِ 
لئلا يضجر بضيق حاله وشدة كربه فيكره ذلك بقلبه ويتكلم بما لا يليق Imam Nawi rahimahullah ta'ala in his explanation of Sahih Muslim, he said it's disliked to make the person say it more than once because the person is in a state of great difficulty at the time of death and it may lead the person to say something uh, which is not appropriate at that time or it may lead the person to have some type of dislike in his heart pertaining to having to say La ilaha illallah. So the correct thing as the brother mentioned is to say it only once. Um, the author he says مَرَّةً وَلَمْ يَزِدْ عَلَى ثلاث. That is to be said once and it shouldn't be done more than three times for the reasons that we mentioned. Uh, if we find however that a person, though we are sitting around him, this sick person, and we are saying لا إله إلا الله and the person is not saying it, at this point we would have to try to command the person to say لا إله إلا الله. So in general it's to be done with softness and gentleness because uh, we're bearing in mind and we're keeping in mind how difficult the situation is for the dying person. But if we're finding that the person is not saying it, then we try our best to command him also in a gentle manner to say La ilaha illallah. So you say it once and you don't increase upon three times. The author he says, إِلَّا إِنْ يَتَكَلَّمَ بَعْدَهُ فَيُعِيدَ تَلْقِينُهُ بِرِفْقٍ Unless the person he says it uh, and then after having said it, he starts to speak. Because of course the sunnah is that after the person has said La ilaha illallah, the people shouldn't engage in any kind of conversation or discussion other than the reading of the Quran or the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if the person speaks after saying La ilaha illallah, then it's uh, mustahab, it's recommended that it's repeated, that the talqeen is repeated for him. A point to mention here, also if you are in the situation where you are at, in the presence of a non-Muslim who is passing away, it's recommended to make talqeen for that person also, but in the more form of a da'wah, uh, inviting him to Islam, and in the form of commanding to him Islam. To, to Islam. Uh, Imam Ibn Hayban, rahimahullah ta'ala, he collected the hadith where the Prophet wasallam would say to Abi Talib, his um, grandfather, his uncle, on his deathbed, he said to him, وسلم, قُلْ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا اللَّهِ أَشْفَعْ لَكَ بِهَا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ he says, say la ilaha illallah, I will use it to intercede for you on your behalf on the day of judgment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even if you are uh, in the presence of a non-Muslim who is passing away, it's important to remind that non-Muslim or to teach that non-Muslim la ilaha illallah and to invite them to Islam. Question here, why is there only one shahada? Why are you only saying la ilaha illallah? Why are you not saying shahadatain? Why are you not saying la ilaha illallah, Muhammad rasulullah why is it only one shahada, la ilaha illallah, and not both of the shahadatain? The ulama, may Allah have mercy upon them, they say the reason there's only one shahada from the shahadatain, just to say la ilaha illallah, is because this is easy upon the person who's in that extreme difficulty. And for them to say both of the shahadatain is going to be difficult for them. And also they say, that the second part of the shahada, the second from the shahadatain, is um, a, necess a, a, a necessary component of the first shahada. It's uh, inevitably found within the first shahada that when somebody says la ilaha illallah, understanding what they are saying, then of course that entails um, that entails that they understand Muhammad Rasulullah. That's why the ulama they say this is mustalzimatun. It uh, necessitates that it will come uh, automatically in meaning. The author he says, وَيَقْرَأُ إِنْدَهُ يَاسِينَ And this is something shocking to many people that they hear this. The author Al-Hijawi he said, it's mustahab to read Surah Yasin at the time when the person is passing away. So this hadith is uh, collected, the one I'm going to mention by Imam Ahmed, who would act upon this as many of the tabi'een acted upon this hadith also, as did Shaykh al-Islam al-Ibn Taymiyyah. And in fact, the majority of the ulama from the madhahib all of them act upon this uh, teaching except for the Maliki scholars. Okay, so the hadith is collected by Imam Ahmed, Abu Dawood, Ibn Majah, Ibn Hibban, Al Bayhaqi, and Al Kubra, and others, where the Prophet وسلم, said, Iqra'u Yaseen ala mawtakum. Read Surah Al Yaseen upon your dead, meaning that when they are dying at the time of dying, read Yaseen for them. So many of the ulama they held that this is something which should be done, and in fact, many of the tabi'een they held also that this is something should be done. 
However, there were great uh, muhaddithin, great scholars of hadith that said um, this hadith is uh, inauthentic. From them was Imam al nawawi rahimullah ta'ala, in Khulasat al-Ahkam, he said that the hadith is not authentic. However, as we mentioned, many of the ulama from the present and past and imams of the tabi'een and imams like Imam Ahmad and Ibn Taymiyyah held that it's something which is mustahab to do, to read Surah Al-Yaseen at the time of the person passing away. Sheikh Mansour Saqib, in his explanation, he mentions a, a nice point pertaining to this. He says, وَلَعَلَّ الْحِكْمَةُ فِي ذَلِكَ الْإِسْتِمَالِ لِإِسْتِمَالِهَا عَلَىٰ أَحْوَالِ الْقِيَامَةِ He said, maybe the wisdoms pertaining to reading Surah Al-Yaseen uh, on the dead person as they are dying is that it reminds the person about the uh, day of judgment. وَنَعِيمَ الْجَنَّةِ And it reminds them about the bounties of Jannah. وَعَذَابَ النَّارِ And it reminds them about the hellfire. So this, all of this, the Jannah, talking about Jannah in Surah Al-Yaseen is going to encourage them and give them hope of meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the points about the day of judgment and the points about the hellfire are going to make them want to make tawbah to Allah azawajal. وَمَا فِيهَا مِن ذِكْرِ زَوَالِ الدُّنْيَا and it reminds them in Surah Al Yaseen, talking about how the dunya is about to leave. So, this reading of the Quran, Surah Al Yaseen, on the dead person eases the ruh in its journey, leaving the body. Uh, and it helps the person to have good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at this critical time, at this time when it's imperative to have good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet Sallallahu he said pertaining to this in Sahih Muslim, لا يموتن أحدكم إلا وهو يحسن ظن بالله سبحانه وتعالى That none of you should die except that he is in a state of having good opinion, meaning having hope in Allah Subhanahu wa Taala's mercy. So it's imperative that the person is reminded with the mercy of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala at the time of his death, and reading Surah Al Yasin or other portions of the Quran at the time of his death will help give him hope and it will bring ease to the body and ease to the soul and allow for the soul to hopefully be taken out from the body in an easier manner. However, the important point to mention is that Yasin after the person's death is not to be read as Ibn Taymiyyah and others held that this is a bid'ah, this is an innovation. It's not to be read after the death of a person. The author, may Allah have mercy upon him, he said, وَيُوَجِّهُهُ إِلَى الْقِبْلَاتِ that the person um, who is dying or who has died is made to face the Qibla. The Prophet وسلم, in the hadith collected by Imam Abu Dawood and authenticated by Shaykh Al Albani, Rahimullah Ta'ala, he said, um, Bayt al Haram, Qibla tukum, Ahya and wa amwatan. The Prophet وسلم, said that the Kaaba is your Qibla whether you are alive or you are dead. So it's important that when it's recommended that the person he is directed towards facing the Qibla. فَإِذَا مَاتَ سُنَّةَ تَغْمِيدُهُ If the person dies, once he has died, then it's sunnah that the eyes of the person are closed. It's sunnah that the eyes of the person are closed. We find in Sahih Muslim that the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّ الرُّوحْ إِذَا قُبِذَ تَبِعَهُ الْبَصَرُ That verily the soul, if it is taken by the angels, then the eyes, they follow it as it is leaving the body and being taken up to the heavens. So the eyes, they are following soon after death, uh, the soul being taken up by the angels. So what is another reason? Uh, what is the wisdom, do you think, of closing the eyes at the time of death? What is from the wisdoms of closing the eyes at the time of death? Ahsan Tabarak Allah that's correct. So it's not scary. You can imagine people looking at the corpse uh, and the eyes are fixated wide open, then this could scare the people and it's not a nice mandar, it's not a nice thing to look at. The author he said, وَشَدُّ لَحْيَيْهِ And it's important, it's recommended that the jaws of the person are tightly wrapped together. The jaws of the person are tightly wrapped together for the same illa as the brother just mentioned, that the person, his mandar, his appearance is not scary and off-putting. And also, for another reason, another illa, is that the, um, you don't want, when the person is being given ghusl, you don't want water to be going into the body through the mouth. And nor do you want any type of insects or anything of that nature crawling into the mouth. So it's important that his lahyay, that his jaws are tightly wrapped um, and left shut. The author, he says, وَالْتَلْيِينُ مَفَاصِلِهِ And it's imperative that the 
Once the person has died, it's the blood in the body stops moving around and this causes the body to quickly become stiff. So it's important that at that time, somebody moves the joints and the limbs of the person a little bit. When you move the joints and the limbs of the person at this time of death, when the heart has stopped beating and the blood has stopped, this allows for the body to retain some of its supple nature, some supple ability so that when the ghusl is given, it won't be too difficult for those who are giving the ghusl. So the talin is done by extending the hand, the arm for example, and bringing it back to the body and then being placed by the side of the body. Likewise, that is done for the legs. The legs are brought up towards the stomach and then stretched out again. The author says, It's imperative, it's recommended that the um, clothing of this person is taken off except for the uh, clothing which is uh, the undergarments, the clothing which is covering the aura. Uh, one of the reasons that they mention that the clothing should be taken off is that they say that the clothing can get stuck to the body, to the skin, and therefore that will uh, speed up the deterioration, the decomposition of the body, which is not something which is uh, wanted. And also, if any najasa comes out from the body, this is going to be uh, on the clothes, which is going to cause a mess and cause a situation which is not wanted. The author, he says, وَسَطْرُهُ بِثَوْبٍ and it's imperative that after the clothes have been taken off, then a sheet or clothing is put on him, clean clothing after he's uh, been washed. Rather, what it means here is that a sheet is put on him. And this shows, you, this shows us the importance of the aura being um, observed, whether the person is in life or the person is in death. This is part of the uh, ikram and the takrim of Bani Adam. The Bani Adam, he has to cover his aura and she has to cover aura whether she is alive or whether he or she are dead. Okay? وَلَقَدْ كَرَمْنَا بَنِي Adam. Allah says, Verily we have given status and honor to the sons of Adam. So the aura is to be covered in life and in death. The author, he says, وَوَدْعُوا حَدِيدَةٍ عَلَى بَطْنِهِ And some metal is to be put on the person's body, on the person's stomach. Right? Some metal, not heavy and not too light, is to be put uh, not under the clothing, not under the sheet, but above the sheet. Uh, on the person's stomach. Why do you think this is? Why do you think that we would need to put some metal uh, that has some weight on the stomach of the person that has passed away? Barakallah feek, exactly. So the ulama, they say that this is done to prevent the bloating. And it's not to be something which is too heavy because that would cause maybe a rip in the body and that is something which is not wanted at all. However, in uh, countries which have uh, modern amenities, uh, the West, for example, uh, they have fridges where the body is stored until the time of burial. This obviously wouldn't need to be done. Uh, where it would need to be done is in the many poor parts of the Muslim world and uh, other parts of the world where a Muslim community exists and the Muslims would pass away. That's where it would be needed to be done uh, to prevent the body from bloating. The author, he says, وَوَدْعُهُ عَلَى sariri غُسْلِهِ The body, uh, once the person has passed away, in terms of its preparation should be put immediately on the place where it's going to be washed. Uh, the reason the ulama they mentioned this that if any najasa exits from the um, from the body uh, part where the uh, najasa normally exits then it's easy for the najasa to be washed away because it's put in the place where the bodies are normally set up to be washed right and also they say that one of the reasons it's not left on the floor uh, unless the floor is extremely um, not permeable, it's hard, if the floor is uh, solid, then the body can be left on the floor, otherwise it's good to put it up on the table where it's going to be washed, is otherwise, you know, uh, insects, etc. can start to attack the body if it's left on the floor. So for those two reasons, it's imperative that it's put on the place where it's going to be washed. The author, he says, مُتَّوَجِّحًا مُنْحَدِرًا نَحْوَ رِجْلَيْهِ that the person's body is put facing towards the Qibla, meaning that his feet are facing towards the Qibla, and that his head and chest is slightly raised above his feet. The reason that his head and chest is slightly raised above his or her feet is so that if there's anything in that area which needs to come out uh, from the fluids, etc., bodily fluids, then they will easily come out before the ghusl is done. So when the person is put facing the Qibla, the feet are facing the Qibla, the chest and the head are slightly above, the slightly elevated above the level of the feet. The author, he says, 
it's highly recommended the author is saying that when the person has passed away that the people they rush in his tajhiz in the preparation of the janaza and his ghusl and his takfeen all of these things they should be done quickly why because in bukhari and muslim the prophet sallallahu said from the hadith of abu huraira radiyallahu anhu asri'u bil janazati be quick and hasty with the janaza fa in taku salihatan fa khayrun tuqaddimunaha for verily if it's if it's a righteous soul then it's good that you are rushing this person towards meaning that the person is rushing towards uh, meeting his rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and if it's other than that meaning if it's an evil person then it's evil that you are getting rid of from your necks meaning that you are removing this evil person from amongst your midst from amongst your community so the Prophet وسلم, he recommended and he advised that the uh, janaza and everything pertaining to it should be done quickly the only time delay of some uh, amount of time is allowed if if there is a need for uh, helpers to be found or people to be brought to pray on the janaza or the relatives need some time to uh, come to attend the janaza or if there's a fard salah which the people are soon going to pray so then they would pray the fard salah before they go ahead and they pray the janaza salah so in these situations some delay is allowed however it's uh, recommended and it's always pointed out by the scholars that the delay shouldn't be there unless there's a need the author he says he puts a condition in mata ghayra fajatin he says this tajhiz this isra this being quick okay in the preparation of the uh, the dead person's funeral rites etc is if the person didn't die fajatan Fajatan is if the person is, has a sudden death, meaning that there was no obvious causes leading up to the person's death. Uh, the person died in his sleep, the person was sitting there at his table reading a book and all of a sudden he passed away. And this is a sign from the sign of the Day of Judgment that the Prophet ﷺ said from the sign from the signs of the Day of Judgment that there, there will be multiple fajr, there will be sudden death where a person will be taken away suddenly. Allah marzikna husn al-khatima. We ask Allah to give us a good end. So if it's a sudden death, then the author is saying that the issue of uh, rushing to do his funeral rites is not applied in this situation. Why is this an exception? Why when the person has a sudden death, do we not rush to prepare his body for burial, etc.? Why is the author saying this? Ahsant barakallahu feek. So the ulama, they say that in general, a day or two or three should be waited before the person is buried. Uh, so that one could establish uh, that, his, uh, that he has actually died. It is not a state of coma of some sort that he has fallen into. But of course, with med modern technology, uh, people of medicine, they know how to check whether the person is alive or dead. And if we are living in places that we have that technology, uh, where the um, corona knows how to determine whether the person has died or not, then there's no need for this to be done. However, it's an, if it's in a poor country where the technology is not available, then the people should wait for a day or two or three to ensure that the person has actually died before burying him, uh, as that would be a tremendously scary situation, burying a person that, and they haven't died. The author, he says, And it's recommended that the wasiyah, the will of this person, is rushed to be implemented. It's recommended that quickly before the person's burial, that his wasiyah in terms of any actions that he wanted to be carried out and any distribution of uh, wealth that he had written should be carried out. Uh, Sheikh Abdul Salam al-Shawayr in his explanation he mentioned an important point. He said that if the person has put in his wasiyah, put in his will that he would like to be buried in a distant land from where he died, he said it's more recommended, it's better that the person is buried in the land where he died, in the locality where he died. So it's not in this situation, it's not imperative that you have to carry out uh, what the person put in the wasiyah pertaining to where he should be buried or where he wants to be buried. The author he said, And it's imperative to be quick in um, its wajib, it's not mustahab like the other things which were mentioned, it's wajib. It's wajib to be quick in carrying out uh, the, the debts fulfilling the debts of this person. Why is it wajib that, this, uh, that the debts of this person should be fulfilled, should be paid off? Why is it wajib? 
Why is it an obligation upon the close relatives and if not the close relatives, then the community at large? Barakallah feek. Yes, in that situation, the Prophet ﷺ didn't do the janazah on the person who had uh, debts to pay. And also the Prophet ﷺ in the hadith in Ahmad in Tirmidhi, the Prophet ﷺ said, نَفْسُ الْمُؤْمِنْ مُعَلَّقَةٌ بِضَيْنِهِ حَتَّى يُقْدَعَنْهُ the Prophet ﷺ said that the soul of the believer is connected to his debt until it is paid on his behalf, whether it's taken from his uh, what he's left, his uh, his uh, inheritance that he's left for the people, uh, or it's taken from anybody who volunteers it to pay on his behalf. And Sheikh Hamad Al Hamad, in his explanation, he said, uh, what it literally means is that the person is not going to receive any of the bounties from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which are in store for him until the debt is removed from his neck. So it shows us how important it is to live a life debt free. In fact, in one of the hadith which I believe is in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ said that even the shuhada, the shuhada are not entered into their places of reward until their debts are paid off for them. So the debts are those debts which are owed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which are like obligatory zakah or those debts which are owed to the people like loans which need to be paid. Okay, So it's imperative that the debts are paid off. Uh, we come to the end of the things which I wanted to mention in this section. Uh, just to add quickly two points. The ulama that they say that um, the dead person, it's okay to look at him and it's okay to kiss him even after the person has been wrapped up in the shroud. You can unravel the shroud, you can kiss the person and you can look at the person as, that, as that's what Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu did uh, at the time of the death of the Prophet sallallahu Second point that I wanted to mention was that uh, to announce the death of a person is not forbidden in Islam. What's forbidden is announcing the death of a person in the way of um, in the way of um, recollecting virtues that he had, extolling his virtues and praising him uh, more than he should be praised. So that is what is not recommended, that is what is disliked, is that the person, you know, an obituary is made for him where lots of things are mentioned about him, that he did such and such in life. This is not recommended in Islam. Rather, all that should be done is that the death of a person should be announced and announce when the funeral is going to be and uh, encouraging people to attend and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best wa sallallahu alayhi wa muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam anything which was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala any shortcomings and mistakes were from myself and shaitan I ask Allah azawajal to make us this deed that we have done heavy in our scales so that we can benefit at the time of death and thereafter if you have any questions on the topic then feel free wa jazakumullahu khair